Okay. So um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, this seminar is about EB2 NIW from petition to United States Green Card. Thanks so much Duke University for, for inviting my Green Card story for, for this talk. We are very, very happy. First thing first, disclaimer, okay? So we are not immigration attorneys and we, we do not give any type of legal advice. Um, the reason why we are here to talk about EB2 and W is, is because we file for this question by ourselves and we have worked with different people to basically either draft their patient cover letter or review the, the one that they, they wrote by themselves. So if you need like legal advice, please consult an immigration lawyer. About myself, so my, my name is Bobola Akitomide and jo jo joining me is Olanike. We, we both self petition for our EB2 NIW um, and it was approved. And we have worked with a lot of people, maybe through our consultation service or by evidence to draft a pension cover letter or review that pension cover letter. So um, please follow us on our social media platform. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at My Green Card Story. And we're also on X. Um, we have a website www.mygreencardstory.com. Please feel free to visit our website. Um, on, on our website, you'll see um, the range of services that we render. We have a consultation whereby we help people to figure out if they're eligible and also help them to identify their strength when put together a pension for EB2 NIW. We have the premium service where we help people to draft their pension cover letter. We have the, the, the guided tour. And that's for those that want to write the, the cover letter by, by, the, by themselves, but they need some, some kind of assistance. Then we have the review service where we help people to review the cover letter that they've already um, written by themselves. So let's dive deep into today's conversation. Who is a lawful permanent resident? A lawful permanent resident is also known as green card holders, a non-US citizen that are lawfully authorized to live permanently within the United States. So as a lawful permanent resident or a green card holder, you can get employment without restriction. Also, you can own properties. I know that in some states, you can, you can probably buy a house without being a green card holder. I think in Texas, you can buy a house without being a green card holder. However, I, if someone was telling me that in the state of Colorado, that you can, if you are on H1B, you cannot buy a house. You need to be either a US citizen or a permanent resident before you are allowed to, to buy a, a property in, in, in Colorado. Another benefit of being a green card holder is if you have a green card and you are get you are enrolled in an academic position and uh, in an academic program in like a government you know, university you are entitled to pay in state tuition or out of state tuition. So that means you are paying a lesser amount. Also, you can also join the US Armed Forces. So there are different ways you can obtain a green card. There is um, uh, the asylum route. There is the U US the diversity visa lottery. There is the family base. And also there is the employment Based category. So we are focusing on the employment based category. And, and there are diff, there are about there are five subdivisions under the employment based category. There's EB1. I'm sure so, some of you have heard about EB1. It's for non citizens of extraordinary ability, an outstanding professor or researcher or multinational executive or manager. EB2, which is the focus of today's presentation, is for those that, that hold an advanced degree or its equivalent or exceptional ability. EB3 is for skilled workers, professionals or other workers. EB4 is for um, religious wo 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 workers. 
AB5 is for investors. So if you have like $800,000 or $1 million and you like to invest in, in the US economy, you can always file for, for, for EB5. So now let's focus on the second category on that employment base, that's EB2. The first thing is I like to differentiate between EB2 and EB2 NIW. EB2 means employment base two, okay? So people that are filing for EB2, they have a job, okay? With a company. So the, the, the company will now file a labor certificate for them. A labor certificate is, is a way, um, uh, is a form that they, they, they need to fill and they need to show that there's no American that can do that job. So they need to test the market. They need to advertise th th that job and see if there's an, any American that is available to, to do that job. If there's no American that, that, that can do that job, then the Department of Labor will issue them a labor certificate. Then they will now turn in a petition for EB2. Whereas in the case of EB2 NIW, you don't need to have a job to file for EB2 NIW. And you don't need to get a labor certificate to file for EB2 NIW. You are telling the, the, the United States that they should waive the requirement for a job and waive the requirement of a, of a labor certificate and approve your petition for green card under EB2 NIW because your proposed endeavor, that is the problem you want to solve for the US or a solution you, you, you are bringing as national um, interest or national importance. So that's why EB2 and NIW is also referred to as a national interest with waiver, okay? And you don't need a lawyer to file for you. You don't need an employer to file for you. You can basically put the pension together by yourself. To be eligible for EB2 and NIW, you need to show that you have an advanced degree or exceptional ability. Then you need to show that you have a purpose and that has substantial merit and national importance. One thing that I like to emphasize when talking about green card, especially EB2 NIW, is that it is family friendly, which means if your pension is approved and you have a spouse or a child that is not a green card holder or a US citizen, you and your immediate family would adjust your status together. That means you now turn in a set of application to obtain your green card. So let's dive deep into the requirement for EB2 NIW. So there are three ways you can be eligible to file. The first one is if you have an advanced degree, that is, so a, ma a master's degree is an advanced degree, a PhD degree, a law degree, a pharmacy degree, a, 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 um, a medical degree, all those are advanced degrees. So if you have any of them, you are eligible to file for EB2 NIW. And that way that you can meet the elig eligibility requirement is if you have a bachelor's degree with five years of work experience in your field. The third way that you can be eligible is if you meet three out of the six requirements for exceptional ab ability. And the six requirements are, number one, you must show your academic record, that is your transcript and your diploma. Number two, you must show evidence that you have 10 years of work experience in your field. No, number three, you must show evidence of your professional license. I know for people in the tech field, they have like all these uh, certifications like Capital TA Plus. People in the finance field or, or business field, they, they might have like all these series C, 7, and 9 um, certification. Another evidence that you must show is that you command the high salary. I can show that by showing them your W2, your pay slip, and things like that. And also, you must show evidence that you are a member of a professional society. Then also evidence that you, you, you have been recognized in your field and you have contributed to your field. So if you can show three out of the six um, requirements, you are also eligible for EB2 NIW. However, we tell people that the simplest way to show that you are eligible is just to show that, oh, see, you have an MBA. This is my diploma and, and this, this is my, my transcript. Therefore, I am eligible to file for EB2 NIW. Okay, so now let, let's move deeper. Let's break it down into two stages. There are two stages involved in filing for EB2 NIW. The first stage is the preparation stage, 
where you turn in your, your form I-140. And the second stage is the adjustment of status stage or the consular processing. So I will continue with the first stage. As soon as I'm done, I will hand over to Nike to walk us through this, the second stage of EB2 NIW. So the first stage, petition for alien workers. For, for this stage, you are going to fill three forms. The first one is form I-140, okay? That's immigrant petition for alien workers. So this, this form will not take you more than seven minutes to fill. And in this form, USS is just asking for your name, your date of birth, um, where you live. If you're in the US, they want to know your immigration status. The last time you flew into the US, they want to know, uh, they want information about your passport number. Then if you are married and you have children, or if you're not married and you have children, they want to know, they want you to provide information about your immediate family members, like their name, their, their date of birth, if they will be adjusting their status in the US or, or, or applying for visa outside the, 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 the US. So as soon as you have filled this form, you also pay, you need to pay a filing fee for this form, which is $715. In addition to that $715, you need to pay an asylum program fee, $300, okay? Now, USS is charging everyone this $300, so you can't waive it. The second form that you need to fill is the ETA 989. In this form, you, you write about your um, work experience, your um, educational background, also any certification that, that you have or, or, or any training that you have taken. There's no application fee for, 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 for your ETA 989. The third form that you need to fill is the G1145. And with that form, you are authorizing USCIS to communicate with you electronically, either through text messages or emails. Now, I know that some people are interested in premium processing, which means they want um, they want feedback from USCIS concerning their petition as soon as possible. So if you want to file for premium processing, you need to fill an additional form, which is form I-901, okay? And if you are doing premium processing, USCIS says that they will get back to you within 45 days. So, and the fee for that is, in addition to the application fee for form I-140, which is $715, and the asylum fee, which is $300, you will pay an extra $2,805 if you are seeking premium uh, uh, processing. So after filling all those forms, you need to attach some supporting document uh, uh, to your petition, and that includes your CV. We tell people that there's a difference between a resume and a CV. So if you are applying if you, are, if you are applying for a job to, um, uh, um, um, if you want to send a job application to Chase or, or, or BlackRock, you send like your one page or, or two page resume. But when you are applying for this kind of petition, a resume will do you arm. What you need is a CV. I will tell people to, to get an academic CV. So look, look at the CV of your MBA advisor. They are like maybe 25 or 30 pages. And your CV must have everything that you have done, like your work experience, your publications, your um, license, your certifications. If you have been invited to give a talk at what economic forum, should, it, it needs to be on your CV. If you have held any leadership position, it needs to be on your CV. If you have gotten any award, it should be on your CV. If you have gotten any form of grant, or fellowship. So let's say you got a fellowship with United Nations or, or World Bank. It should be on your CV. If you, have, if you have held any leadership position, it should be on, on your CV. If you have consulted for any government organization, non-profit or intergovernmental organization, it should be on your CV. It has to be very, very detailed. In addition to your CV, you turn in a petition cover 
letter. And in that cover letter, you need to address three prompts, which, which, which like which basically mean three areas or three important things. The first one is you must show that your proposed endeavor has substantial merit and national importance. So the way we explain substantial merit to people is that is, is basically is this: why why should the US be concerned with, with your proposed endeavor? Then national importance, we explain it in this way. Think about national security, food security, sustainable development, competitive advantage, things like that. Climate change, those are the things that have national importance to the US. After you have addressed that, then when it comes to the second part, which is that you are well positioned to advance your purpose and evolve, that's where you talk about your work experience, your educational background, your award, your fellowships, your leadership position with various professional or organization. Everything that you have done will be written under the work position to advance your purpose and level. The last part of your core letter is that to, to be beneficial to the US to win the job offer and the labor self kit. That's when you talk about why your purpose and level is sufficiently urgent to warrant for going a labor self kit. Also, you, you can also address why you cannot obtain a labor certificate. And that thing that can address is, even if there are Americans that can do the job, the United States will, will still benefit from your expertise and purpose and level. So you can mention and discuss two or three benefits that the US would derive from your expertise and purpose and level. After you finish writing your core letter, obviously you need to attach a copy of your academic record your transcript and your diploma. Uh, on that evidence that you need to provide a recommendation letters. So we tell people to get two set of recommendation letters. The first one is from those that they have worked with. So for example, let, 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 let's say you got an internship with um, PricewaterCoopa or Morgan Stanley. It's going to be good if you can get a reaction letter from maybe your advisor during your internship to, to state that, oh, it is true. Odunfa or, or Lara what with um, Morgan Stanley, and this was a contribution to our organization and also to the financial and consulting field in general. Then the second reaction letters will be from an independent expert, which basically means an expert in your field, but you have never worked with that person in any shape or, or form, okay? So that person will just write about your expertise and your purpose endeavor and, and the benefit that, that the US would derive from your purpose endeavor. Other type of support document that you, you can attach include publication, that's if you have published a paper in a peer, review conference, or maybe you have published a paper or published an article with Wall Street Journal or New York Times, or maybe you have published an article with uh, the business school at Duke University, make sure you attach a copy. If you have any professional license or professional certification, attach a copy of it. If you have given any talk, or maybe you have been asked to anchor a uh, um, 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 a section of a talk during the World Economic for, for, for Forum. Or maybe um, World Bank had a symposium in, in New York and you helped to anchor a section of that symposium. We want to provide the evidence. And also award beside grant and so on and so forth. So after you have your cover letter and you have all your evidence, you mail everything in a, in a single envelope to USCIS. So for regular filing, which means you pay the $715 together with the $300 asylum fee to take between four cell months before USCIS make a decision on your petition. However, if you do premium filing, which means you are paying the $715 for uh, which is the application fee for form I-140, the $300 for the asylum fee, 
and also the extra $2,805 for the premium processing, USS says they will get back to you within 45 days. So now when you turn in your, your petition, it's either your petition is approved or you get the RFE. RFE is request for further evidence. They will send it to you in a mail and they will explain why they're giving you that RFE. If they believe that you, you have not demonstrated that your proposed endeavor has national importance, it will be stated in that RFE. And also in, in that RFE, they, they probably request for you to provide more supporting documents to justify your petition for EB2 NIW. And when you send them the response to the RFE, usually it's either that petition is approved or it's denied, depending on how you're able to answer all the questions that were raised in RFE and the additional support documents that you supplied to USCIS. Okay, so now let's talk about power date. There's something called priority date. Priority date is the day you filed your petition for EB2 NIW with USCIS. So let's say you put, you have put all your documents together and you sent in your documents and USCIS received your, 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 your document or your petition today, June 1st, 2024. June 1st, 2024 will be your power, your power priority date. And usually, as soon as USS gets your document, they will send you either a text or email that, oh, Odunfa, we have received your petition on today, and they will assign you a number, okay? I will, in, in subsequent slide, I will talk about that receipt number. Now, this priority date that they give you determines it, when you can adjust your status. It also determines when you will eventually get your green card because immigration benefit in the US is based on first come, first served. Okay, now the next one is from I-797. No, so as soon as USS gets your petition for EB2 NIW, they will send you a mail and that mail will contain the form I-797, notice of action. Anytime you turn in a document to USS, whether it's your I-140, I-485, I-131, or I-765, you always get it from I-797, Notice of Action, okay? So this example that has been shown on this screen, it, it shows how the approval notice for, from, uh, for EB2 NIW looks like. So you will see it has a receipt number. This is the, the receipt number. So as soon as you turn in your petition, they will give you a receipt number. And this is the number that you use to track the status of your application on USS website. This is the power written date. So that means this person turned in their petition on April 30, 2018. So this, this is actually my, my, my own approval notice okay then in this box you see the name of the person and the address of, of the person case type you see that the person turning the patient for i-140 the professional is bill john smith beneficiary deal um deal john smith and notice type approval notice section individual with advanced degree or exceptional ability so this notice just shows that this person's petition for I-140, which is for specifically for EB2 NIW, has been approved, okay? And it was approved on this notice date, October 2nd, 2018. So it took about six months for this petition to be approved. Another major thing that you, you need to know is the USS Visa Bulletin. Remember that in, in the last two previous slides, I said that your priority date will determine where you can turn in your adjustment of status document. So let's say you turn in your petition to USCIS and it was received today, June 1st, 2024. Your priority date is June 1st, 2024. And let's assume that USCIS decides to approve your petition on August 1st, 2024, okay? 
even though your petition has been approved by August 1st, 2024, you cannot turn in your adjustment of status document immediately to get your green card because your priority date is not current. So the way you know whether your priority date is current is by checking USCIS visa bulletin. And it is a monthly bulletin that shows the adjustment of status filing charts. So each month they release this visa bulletin and they state the date of those that they will be accepting their adjustment of status documents. The visa bulletin of June 2024 is out. And in that visa bulletin, the priority date is February 2023. And that means those that are turning their petition as at February 2023 or older, that is January 2023 or 2022, those are the ones that can turn in their adjustment of status documents. Okay, that's why there are so many people that their power date is from March 2023 up to uh, May 2024. The petition has been approved, but they are yet to turn in the adjustments to status and even get EAD card or green card. And that's because their priority date is not correct. So on this note, I'm going to hand over to, to Nike to walk us through the second stage or second phase of applying for a green card under EB2 NIW. Ola Nike, over to you. Thank you so much, Babola. And thank you everyone for or staying with us up to this time. Usually we we under promise and over deliver. So Odufa, thank you for being patient with us. I know we said 15 minutes for Bobola and 10 minutes for my part, but we just want people to get the entire gist. So if we are walking the happy path, and like Bobola said, your I-140 is approved. That means your petition for alien worker has been approved. Everything you presented to them, they think it's true and that you have valuable substance to offer the United States. The next stage is to adjust your status. So the I-140 approval itself, you cannot use it as EAD. You cannot use it to travel. You cannot use it as a green card. So you need to change your status from maybe say F1, J1, visiting, whatever visa status you were on when you when you applied for the I-140, you need to change it to the green card. And there are two, two different types of adjustments of status. So those of us that are in the United States already will fall in the first category. And those that are outside the United States, so this their I-140 petition was done while they are in Nigeria or any other country, their own will be separate and usually longer. <laughs> so if you're in the United States, you can go straight up. Once it's your priority date, like Obola explained, you can go on and follow the process I will be talking about. However, if you're outside the United States, you will follow another process which involves consular processing. And um, let me see. Okay. I thought I was the one sharing, sorry. So adjustment of status, what is involved? I just want to share first that when you apply for your I-140, you as the main petitioner, you'll be the only one paying all that money Bobola talked about. None of your dependents will be paying. You put their name on the form, but they will not be applying or anything. This adjustment of status point is when they will now fill their own forms and they would also apply. So if you have two children and your wife, you need to get their home adjustment status form. That form is called I-485. You need to get for yourself as the main petitioner, you need to get for your spouse, and you need to get for each child that is under 18. So that's a lot of money, but you're sure that everybody's getting their green card. So it's good money being spent. So the fee for the form itself, 
the four uh, I four eighty five is a thousand four hundred and forty dollars for adults, and it's nine fifty for children. Anyone you know younger than is it fourteen years or eighteen? One of the two. <laughs> And usually the processing time is one year. So if I if you submit your adjustment of status today, they would, you know, probably get in touch with you that they've received it and they might tell you, go for your biometrics, go for your medical, all the other things I'm going to talk about, your, your medical history form and processing all of that. But before a year, six months to a year, you get your um, EAD, that's your authorization to work, and the green card itself. And the green card itself will look like this when it comes. So, <laughs> so when you are adjusting your status, depending on where you are, some people are already on OPT or they have H1B, some form of you know, visa or documentation that allows them to work. So they just put in the adjustments of status. They just want the green card. But if you are someone that your OPT is ending or you don't have H1B, you really need this to work, um, you're going to apply for the I-765. For those of us that are familiar with OPT, we know this is the same form for your OPT, right? So this one is going to help you to get the EAD card and you can do all the filing at the same time if you think it's something you need. So this I-765, if you submit it with the I-485, I is going to be $260. And like I said, it's going to be processed along with your adjust adjustment of status and is going to also within these two, these six months here, is not separate from the one year we talked about. So everything together. And your employment authorization card would look just like this. And we've had people say, oh, uh, my spouse and I, we put in together the adjustment of status and the EAD or the I-765. And my wife got her own before mine. And I am the main petitioner, you know, things like that. But USCIS knows what they're doing. Eventually they're going to send to both of you. So there is no there's no reason to, to fear. Okay. So the third form that you can submit along with your adjustment of status is your travel documents. I'm usually excited to talk about this because a lot of us cannot travel be because of our status and the fear to come back into the United States. So this one is called parole or just travel document, authorization for parole of an alien into the United States. So this one allows you to be able to come back into the United States if you happen to travel while your green card processing is still going on. So, you know, I told you that they, they will send you your EAD and they can send you your travel authorization. So even if your green card is not ready or they've not sent you the green card itself, you can actually travel and come back into the United States with this barrel. And you usually would submit it with, with your adjustment of status. Um, when, you, when you get it, it's going to look like something like this. And you can take that to travel. They understand when they see this document that, oh, this person is neither on OPT or H1B. The person is working on their green card and will soon get a green card. And they will usually admit you back into the United States when you, when you arrive. Um, um, finally, this fourth form is what everybody adjusting their status has to do. It's not optional, like the EAD or the parole. This one, everybody needs to do it. So with your, along with your I-485, your adjustment of status form, you need to go to a civil um, physician, so a doctor that works with the government or they are licensed to work with them for this immigration purpose. And the person is going to examine you um, Usually you you probably have all those vaccines already taken while growing up, but if you don't have evidence, they will make you take all the vaccinations again. But um, they want to make sure you're tuberculosis free, you know, all of this um, diseases, and you would not see the results, right? So they will just envelope it 
with the form. They already have the form in their offices and they would write the result of your evaluation and send it and give it to you to send it to the United States. So this form, it varies, the amount varies depending on where you're located in the United States. You, you, you can get a, a, a doctor that would do all of this for you for 250, some will be 450. And each member of the family has to do it. So it's not just you. Everybody has to pay that money to get their evaluation done and sent along with the adjustment of status. Okay, so you will mail it to the USCIS. So assuming you are in the United States, your I-140 has been approved, you filled the I-485 form, and maybe you need the EAD as well, you filled that, and the parole, and this doctor evaluation, everything is ready. You're going to mail it to the USCIS. Okay, along with that of your spouse or your dependents. So we get this question a lot. Should I put everything in the same envelope or what should I do? Usually you should separate them. Okay, so put the approval of your I-140, put a copy in each of them, put it in that of your spouse, put it in that of each of your child. So that's what they use to trace it back to the initial petition that was approved, but separate it. Okay, and um. When everybody have submitted theirs, they might reach out to you separately or together, okay? The next thing is that they will tell you they've received it and you should go to some um, office, some USCIS office or approved office around you to do your biometrics. So that would usually take like maybe maximum of like four months after you've submitted or six for them to tell you to go do your biometrics. Some people get it earlier and they go put in their um, biometrics. And once you've done that, your cards will start trickling in. So now we have the, I think we have the EAD and we have, is it, but, but I don't know, whatever. But now they are combining the form, the card. EAD is combined with Faro or something like that. But you will get one card that would authorize you to work in the United States. Usually it's the first thing you get before you get your green card. And some people get just the green card straight up because maybe they didn't apply for EAD or they didn't need it. But your cards start coming in and you become a United States permanent resident. Congratulations. Okay. So consular processing, that one is another story. And we'll try to share it because we know that um, recently, we get a lot of inquiry from people in the UK. They want to come to the US. A lot of Nigerians as well. They want to do this whole thing from Nigeria. So the only difference is when you get your um, I-140 approval in the mail, when they get theirs as well, <laughs> the people that are outside the United States, the next thing is they have to, to contact the consular and do an, a, a separate application, okay? They are also going to call them for an interview. And eventually they will ask them for supporting documents, all those things that they used to make their I-140 applications successful. But just to check, it's not so much in detail as before. And then they will give them a visiting visa, a kind of visa that will allow them to come into the United States. I think it's a K visa. Uh, when they give it to them, they will come into the United States along with their family members. When they come into the United States, then they will do their change of status. They will get their green card. So they cannot do that. This process, uh, what we can do from inside the United States, from outside. So when they give them that visa that allows them to travel here, technically as an immigrant, you know, when they get here is when they will get their green card. So um, finally, I'll quickly share my own journey. It's just to put into perspective what's the wait time, but I really don't know if this is valid anymore, but we try to put a face to the journey. So you can also put your face there and be like, okay, if I start now, I'll probably get it 
stands, you know. So for me, I did all this thing in, um, I submitted in uh, May 2020. That was when I submitted my application. And um, this pre-application process, I don't talk about it because it takes longer for some people, depending on, you know, how your recommendation letters come in, how all your evidence that you're trying to get, transcript and things like that come in. Um, so let's just start from this May 2020 when I did send the, the application to the USCIS. And by two weeks later, they sent me notice of receipts. And thankfully, everything was fine. My form, everything was signed. Nothing was returned. So they said they've received it. And um, this is not correct. A year later, this is 2021. So I did not do premium processing. I was still a student. I, I was still in a good status. So there was no need to rush. So I didn't do premium processing or anything. And maybe I was not... Um, an anxious person because some people can't just wait. They can't wait for that long, right? So they do the premium processing. A year later, that's uh, May 2021, I got a notice of approval. So my case was approved. The high 140 part was approved in 2021. And I just chilled. And uh, from May 2021 to November 2021, I just chilled. I didn't do anything. It was not because of priority date at this time. I just didn't see the need for the rush. Well, um, six months later, after my approval, I put in all the application for change of status. So all the form I talked about, HI-485, 765, parole, I put in everything at the same time and just um, chilled. And, you know, they called me for... They, they said to send my medical history. So for some reason, we had sent it together the way we thought, myself and my spouse. We thought it should be done, but they sent it back. But we eventually sent it back to them separately. Maybe they wanted us to send it separately in December. So let's say everything, they got everything in December 2021 to adjust status. By April, they called us to go do our biometrics. So that's like four months. So we did the biometrics and, and like immediately they sent my EAD and sent the green card in June 2022. So I hope that encourages someone. These days it's it's I think it's longer because even if you do par, um, premium processing for the I-140 stage, you still have to wait till it's your priority date before you can adjust your status.